the law, and especially in the, as it relates to uh, the New Covenant law, right? But it didn't, I really didn't land there. I just kind of uh, flew over it and then kept going. But this week's lesson, I've, I've entitled it The Lawgiver. Uh, it could be entitled two or three different things, but uh, The Lawgiver is what I settled on. And The Lawgiver is Jesus. And uh, we're not free from the law. And this lesson... Yeah, I have kind of focused it toward uh, two or three groups of Christians. Uh, one, one particular group is most of Christendom that, that has bought into or has eaten of the leaven that there is, um, there is no law in the new covenant per se. It's just the law of love and that's God doing everything and loving everything and loving everybody and anybody that's in Jesus. And that's about the, the, the length of their understanding of any law that we might be under, much less any imprecation, you know, any curse. And the reality is that we are under a curse if we ha are not obedient to the laws of the new covenant. Uh, that's to one arena of people that I'm addressing this message. Another would be just to those who have been caught up in the Messianic movement and or the Hebraic roots movement, and they've kind of gotten off into that, and uh, they have lost their focus on who the lawgiver is, and that's got some pitfalls that, that I'd like to address. And then third, I guess it'd be just a, a group that I would throw us under, which is it's just good to remind us that Christ is the lawgiver, and that we do walk under the laws of Christ, and that we endeavor by the Holy Spirit to uh, implement them, uh, not only in, in, in word, thought, and action, but just as a part of our nature, just to become like unto Him. And we believe that's possible in the atonement, that, uh, that we can um, be obedient to His laws by the power of the Holy Spirit, and be formed and shaped into his uh, nature. So those are kind of the groups that I've focused this for, this message. And I, uh, as I said, I entitled it The Lawgiver. And the lawgiver is Jesus in the New Covenant. And uh, quite honestly, he was a lawgiver in the Old Covenant too. <laughs> if you look up that word by Moses, it's through Moses. So the law, the Old Covenant was, <laughs> was not Moses. It wasn't Moses that came forth with that. It was the Word of God, the Word of Christ. It was Christ. Christ has always been the lawgiver. And so uh, we are under the law of Jesus. The law of Jesus is, uh, in one place, is specifically mentioned in 1 Corinthians 9.21, where it said, this is said, being not without law to God, but under the law of Christ. Again, 1 Corinthians 9.21. And if anybody, of course, wants these notes, and uh, as I suspect some of you would, and most of you would, uh, they'll be online, and you'll be able to uh, pull them down and copy them off. Uh, God, God twice, God the Father, uh, twice announces, this is my son. You remember that in Scripture, right? Ye, you hear him, right? Uh, Mark 9, 7 is one instance of the father announcing to hear his son. And then again, the spirit witnesses in Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 to that reality where it is written, God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. I don't know that we get the significance of that. It gets lost in, uh, in all of the leaven, in all the misrepresentation. You know, leaven is nothing more than false teaching by false prophets or false teachers that have received their message as doctrines from demons. And it is in that leaven that the church has found itself, much of its belief systems, 
And I don't know that we uh, can say it too often or too much that in these last days, the Father has chosen to speak to us through His Son. Specifically, this is my Son, hear ye Him, Jesus the Christ. And then in Matthew 23, 7 and 8, there's a verse that has in it, one is your teacher, comma, Christ. One is your teacher, comma, Christ. The law and the prophets were until John. Do you remember that scripture? I didn't, I didn't make that up, right? I want you all to try to get into the spirit of what I'm trying to say here. Because I think I'll leave you in the dirt here. I'll leave you in the dust. Could you repeat which scriptures are Matthew, Matthew 23, 7 and 8. Mark 9 and 7 and uh, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. It's actually 10 that says we have one teacher of Christ. Yeah, and if you back up, <coughs> it, it, it back up, it'll, it also says that. It's, it's, it refers to it several times in the same sets of verses. But the point is that I'm trying to make is that Christ is the lawgiver. Christ is the rabbi. Rabbi meaning teacher, right? Uh, he said, don't you be called rabbi but, or teachers, but you have one master or one rabbi. We have one teacher, Jesus Christ. He's one lawgiver, that's Jesus Christ. That's the point of these scriptures. And, and how it be so? Well, because God ordained it to be so that when he sent his son into this earth to manifest himself as the word, 1 John 1, we have then his reference to the law. This is Christ. The law and the prophets were until John. Somebody get that verse up. That's, you, you know that verse? Luke 16, I believe. Luke 16, 16, maybe. Is that right? What's it say? The law and the prophets were until John. John. Since that time, the kingdom of God's preached, and many, every man passes into it. Presses into it. Presses into it. And what's it go on to say? Next verse. And what's it say one verse before? The law and the prophets of the four. Mm -hmm. one he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your heart, for that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. Yep. So we have Christ making a reference here to, to the law and to the hypocrisy that is accompanying these that are uh, pretenders of following Moses' law? Can you read it? Because yeah. That yeah. That's right. For the sake of the inner tube there. Luke 16. Luke 16, 16 is the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. This goes along with that same scripture that has to do with the violent take it by force. Uh, it's a kingdom coming that every man must press to enter and, and it's related in this scripture in, uh, reference, uh, translation as from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. So what did it say? It said from the now, from now, from the days of John the Baptist until now. That was a pretty short time, wasn't it? And we were talking about John the Baptist. Maybe he had been beheaded by now. But it 
but the reference is only for a short period of time this verse speaks in terms of since John's preaching has come, since then men must press to enter and it's, it suffereth violence. The kingdom uh, is, is uh, the inheritance of the kingdom. The dynamic of it has changed since John. Well, who was John? John was the, the forerunner, wasn't he? He was the forerunner of the message of Christ. His message was so, uh, <laughs> so contradictory to that of the, the law of Moses, wasn't it? I mean, he had preached a message of forgiveness of sin uh, and, and in water baptism and repentance, which is totally different than that of the law. So what John was introducing was what Christ was manifesting, was that there is a different dynamic that is going to be from John forward. For John backwards were was the way that God did speak in times past. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. But now he speaks to us in his son. So we have a reference here, a clear, um, a clear disembarkation. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? A watershed. You know, watershed is where like there's a, there's a high ground and the water comes up to the, to the high ground and what's it do? What's the water do when it hits the high ground? It splits. And so that's why it's called a watershed. It, here is the watershed of, of the Word of God. It is John. When John came, and when, he, when he proceeded by a, 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 few, a short time uh, before Christ was manifest as, as who he was, there was this watershed where there was a dividing of, of, of the different approach and the uh, different attainment and the different means unto that attainment. And it is a clear defining that Lord has given us in the Gospels where he says, until the time of John, it was the law and the prophets. And then now... It is something to do with a kingdom of God being preached. Here's the quote from the scripture. Since that time, the time of the prophets, the law and the prophets until John, since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. Luke 16, 16. The old covenant was presented through Moses. The word says, for the law was given by Moses in the Old Covenant, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ in the New Covenant. John 1, 17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace and truth. Well, now isn't that something? I don't know of any... Uh, other two words that have been more abused than those two words, grace and truth. We find the true meaning of grace and truth, we'll find the meaning of what it, it was where the watershed was. The watershed, the law and Moses went this way, and grace and mercy went this way. John the Baptist was this way, pointing this way. The law went that way the followers of the law, the keepers of the law. So here we have in Scripture, by John, uh, John the Revelator, not John the Baptist, that we, uh, we know that Moses gave the law, but by Jesus Christ came truth and grace. Kathy?
Well, there, there's, there, Kathy, the, that you just brought up was, is a wonderful point, and it's a sermon in itself. And that, that sermon being what Christ is speaking of, what's in context he's talking about, is, is that servant that, that had to answer to his master, and his master found out that, that he wasn't a good master, and that he had left, left him or owed him these great vast sums of money. And he, going out, finding all of those debtors that owed his master, he got with them and they had a conversation and they, they said, he said, what do you owe? He said, well, I owe this much. He said, well, cut it in half. And he went to another one. And he said, what do you, how much do you owe my master? Well, cut it in half and I'll sign it. And we'll just, we'll just do this uh, so that I'll be, I'll be uh, welcomed into their houses. So what the Lord was saying was that he was commended because he, even though he didn't know what he was doing, he was portraying the, the heart of a new covenant believer in that a new covenant believer ought to have this type of thinking that this wealth that we have in life should be a means to obtain friends in, in the kingdom coming and not to be held tightly. The Pharisees were covetous. Uh, and there was a message, of course, uh, that's not too unlike the message that we have today, a message of prosperity. And so they, they loved money. And when the Lord had said this, they derided him. And, and he, ma he makes the point here that there is a dynamic that they're unaware of that God uh, puts his stamp of approval on. And that it has to be free, our, our hearts, this part of our striving, a part of our uh, battling to enter into his kingdom has to do with the giving up of wealth and being covetous on this earth. And covetousness is con considered in the eyes of the Lord as idolatry. And even they had, by the traditions of men, had they soothed their own consciences and they were approved by one another inside the traditions and the religion that they had created. And what Christ said to them is what other men consider something, the Lord considers abominable. And so the, the message here in, that Christ is, is really re reverting to, I'm using it to make a point that the law of the prophets was until John, but the reference the Lord made to these Pharisees and scribes was teaching them how that their ideas and concepts about the law would allowed them to have a heart that was covetous. But in his dynamic, in his new dynamic, where men must fight for the, uh, not, uh, you know, not, not, not do the Mosaic law rituals or follow the Mosaic law, but follow him in that in like manner uh, with a heart of no covetousness, who laid down all that he had, who gave all that he had. This was the principle that he was saying uh, will now rule forward. You know, this, this was the law of Moses. You were under it and you perverted it anyway. You weren't really followers of Moses, but, but you perverted it. But he, that's no longer even appropriate to today that following Moses' law for my followers, for the follow, my followers are, are to be like unto me. Follow my laws. My laws being something beyond the laws that they understood. Are you with me? There's a message there, Kathy, that I could get a Get, could get away from on too, but I'm trying to keep it in the context of us having an understanding of who's a lawgiver, and us as Christians are under laws, and why are we why are we under these laws that we are under the laws of Christ?
You're talking about in Christian I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I said this message is focused toward them as one group. Uh, I mentioned three. And uh, this, that's one, one reason I'm bringing this forth and, and making a point of it out of the Scriptures is to show the error of, of abusing uh, the laws or mixing the laws, and, and we, we need to have a defining of the laws. What is the law that we're under, and how is it different from the law of Moses? and why we shouldn't follow the laws of Moses. Those are valid, um, valid pursuits in, the, in, the, in a Christian's pursuit in holiness uh, to Christ. And, and, and you can follow the stream. The stream just is flowing down the riverbank. You can follow it, but it is, it is a tidal wave taking us to a place we don't want to go. And the, this is... A setting us straight, uh, rightly dis- dividing the Word of God, and it's it's in some quarters, it's uh, he's a false prophet. In some quarters, he being me. In other quarters, I am a heretic. So on, I can't win on either side that I'm ministering against. Over here, I'm a heretic. Over here, I'm a false teacher, false prophet. So it doesn't matter to me. God is the judge. And I'm just going to come forth with what I have uh, in, and from the Spirit of God and from the Word of God. And you judge. Again, this message, uh, hopefully, people can get by that, have, uh, that, that will hear this message, will, that have been polarized one way or another, that they can get by this, this poor vessel and these lips of dust, and they can settle back and get over the uh, re- religious furor, that the spirit that would take over anybody that has dogmental attitudes about the Word of God, or that haven't really studied the Word out, but have taken for, for truth those things that other men have taught them. And, and here, I w- this is a process. Let's, we've been years of process of breaking down the Word of God, connecting the dots and showing the truth as opposed to, to uh, true facts, you know, true religious facts. So uh, that's the endeavor here, that in the right spirit, in love, is, 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 is to bring out these points that really, to me, are uh, reminders. I'm not really speaking so much against somebody else's uh, way of interpreting the Word of God, even though it be false, uh, that's kind of a byproduct to me for my, my study and my consecration. Th- that's a byproduct. That's something that I'm doing because of my heart to study out the Word of God to find the way in that I should walk. And the way in that I should walk happens to be a revelation of the Word of God in my accountability, my responsibility to Christ the lawgiver. And while I'm doing that, the main focus is to take his laws, his word, and apply them to my heart. But, but an off, a uh, byproduct of that is, oh, by the way, you guys that are over there that are doing that, you ought to give the word some heed. So that's a byproduct. I didn't go down the road, word to look at the word to, to address them. I'm not interested in addressing them as much as I am as taking the beam out of my own eye. And so it's just a byproduct. I'm, I'm looking more intently into these things that, that you just brought up, Kathy, which is uh, the spirit of covetousness. To me, I go there. I, I relate to that. I, I go, my heart is convicted over covetousness. And so uh, the Lord, is, that's idolatry. And, and he, he expounds that in my heart. And while I'm learning these things, I'm learning how, how deeper and wider is that tributary that the watershed that goes to the Lord and how shallow the waters are that go to the laws of Moses and how deep they are over here, how, how much more accountability. So it, it is down that avenue that I went, and as I said, it's just a byproduct that I bring to the attention of these others groups, whoever they might be that might hear or might listen. 
to understand that we're under the law, the law of Jesus Christ, his laws, and that God has put him as a law giver, and God has given all judgment and authority unto him. And what does that mean in a practical way for us as Christians? Well, I'm going to try to break it out and break it down so there's room for all the Word of God. Because, you know, what we want to do is just take a, a little bit of the Word that aligns itself with the way we think and use that Word, promote that Word, teach that Word as if it was truth. And we leave out large sections of word that de deals with the very reciprocal of that that we are believing. It's just the other side. And you think, well, that's, this is, means the Jews, or that doesn't, it doesn't apply to me, or that, or that. But when you rightly divide the word of God, you, got, you can connect all the dots. You're not confused about what this means or that means. It's the truth. Truth sets you free. Religion just polarizes you. It makes you a, a religious fanatic, you know, and, and it makes you uh, grating. You know, you grouse people because you're so religiously minded. But truth sets us free. So this is an attempt to bring out the truth of the lawgiver, the laws that govern the new covenant, the imprecation that follows it, the accountability, the responsibility, and to what purpose we have been moved from the laws of Moses into the laws of Jesus Christ. For what purpose? What was and and how? Those are good, valid questions that I'm attempting here to take us down that trail. The son prayed, and the father sent another comforter. We've discovered that in John. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit to indwell a believer in Jesus Christ. Not just anybody. The Holy Spirit is just not randomly thrown out on the world. And he doesn't just, irrespective of who they are or what they are, come into them and indwell them. There's only one group on the face of the earth that the Holy Spirit indwells. And that's those that have been bought, paid for, and redeemed by Jesus Christ translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. These are the only recipients, legal recipients, of the power or the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit. So when Christ prayed in John 14, 15, 16, 17, he prayed for another comforter that the Father would send another comforter, and it was the promise of John 7, 7, 37 through 39. It's that promise that that the Father will send the Holy Spirit to indwell us. Well, there it is. There it is. The atonement, purpose, as it relates to the watershed. <laughs> you, you can't follow down the other part, the other tributary, and find in it the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's not there. It's not a part of the Mosaic Covenant. You're never going to find it over there. The only way you're going to find the power of the Holy Spirit, indwelling Holy Spirit, is if you're following under the laws of Jesus Christ. This that has now been since the days of John, that men fight violently to take the kingdom of God. He puts it out, he puts it more on a, on a purpose by purpose, singular, singular, you, me, individual kind of uh, quest as opposed to some overall system that, that ruled and reigned in a in a nation of Israel, the laws of Moses. If you were going to engage in the laws of Moses, you, you had to have, a, the, he had to do the ritual and become a part of the nation of Israel, being circumcised, etc. To do, to be a part of the covenant of Jesus Christ with indwelling power of the Holy Spirit there is an a, a appropriate uh, application, appropriation of his covenant. His words have to find in you preeminence. His words. No one else's words. His words. And so when, when we define that, 
we, we, we're, we're, we're separating there at the watershed. Well, here's the, here's the words that came through Moses that were Christ. And here are the words of Christ as manifested the Son of God, Redeemer, Savior. Here's, here's the law of Moses. That, this tributary, it kept going. And last week I thought, spoke in terms of that being the first husband, good, eternal, <laughs> never to die, not one jot or tittle. It'll always be there always will be a tributary, the laws of Moses. But it's not that law that we Gentiles have found ourselves, or whatever messianic there is among us, has found us following another lawgiver and another set of laws. Why do you make such a big deal of it? Because it's so important and it's so, so abused and so misunderstood and twisted and, and it's stealing the strength and the sap of the life out of Christians. They're just at, a, they're at the watershed. <laughs> they drink one day over here and they drink one day over here or they don't drink of either. They just get up on the bank and just sit there. They don't follow down the river of, Christ, to, or follow the river down the river of Moses. They just get up there on that high ground, just sit there. We've got all we need right here. No use going there. There's nothing down there. No, there's just holiness and a kingdom down there. I wouldn't want to go down there. I mean, you're, you're sitting there in your justification, sitting right there at the watershed. Praise the Lord. You stopped, the, you stopped going down the road that was going to take you under the curse of death. Praise the Lord. But that's not where you were supposed to be. We're supposed to leaving those rudiments. We're supposed to leave them and go on into Jesus Christ, the fullness of him. So that's the, where this message is I'm trying to focus. The, the, fa the son prayed, the father sent the Holy Spirit to indwell believers in Jesus Christ. He said this, if I go, I will send him unto you and he shall guide you into all the truth. For he shall not speak from himself, for he shall take of mine and shall declare it unto you. So the Holy Spirit is not coming to establish another way, to another set of rules and regulations to administer here on this earth. He's coming to share, to, to uh, uh, expand and expound on those words that Christ already gave us. No new, no new gospel. The Holy Spirit is not doing His own thing. The Holy Spirit is bringing all attention and focus on the words of Jesus Christ. For it's by the words of, the, of Jesus Christ and the washing of the Word and the Holy Spirit that we are enabled to develop spiritually and become Christ-like. This, that indwelling grace, or call it grace, in quotes, the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit into our spirit. That was the big S and the little s. Being the divine influence on our character. Listen, I have looked up the word grace, and I'll mispronounce it just like I always mispronounce all Greek and Hebrew words. Forgive me. And last week I kept saying puma, and it's pneuma. You know, it's not, there's no, there's no, you don't pronounce the P, but I, you know, I, I'm liable to say anything up here when it comes to Greek or Hebrew. I may have mispronounced everything. But the point was, is that when you look in Romans chapter 8, you'll find pneuma, pneuma, the, the Spirit, and it won't be saying the Holy Spirit, and it won't be saying the human spirit, it'll just say pneuma. So it is, a, it is, it is on purpose that the Holy Spirit has less, left a vagueness in that chapter, in Romans 8, so that we might understand it is a combination of little s and big s. And here, again, I 
I speak to that indwelling of that grace, which is that word that's so abused, and most of Christendom has settled in because false teachers and false prophets have made an application, a misapplication of a, of a, of a word and truth, a true fact, not a truth, that they have applied to every instance as it relates to a Christian's life. Grace, the undeserved, right? Unmerited favor of God. As if that you and I have had a, have had a, uh, a gift uh, that has been given to us that now uh, rules our life in that it, it, this thing, grace, what we're under, we're under grace, that there's no longer any accountability, not any real accountability unto God, because it's undeserved and unmerited. And the reality is that this empowering Spirit, this Holy Spirit, this gift of the Holy Spirit, is that grace. Grace, favor, power, indwelling. What for? For the divine influence upon your heart so that you might yield unto the Spirit, big S, little s, and that you might crucify the flesh and walk in all worthiness and fruitfulness unto Christ. So the abuse of the word grace, undeserved, unmerited favor, we, we discount that. Uh, although we understand that, that there was a gift, and it is gift, the eternal life, eternal life, is a gift. But what we speak in terms of this grace is a divine influence, a residing, a residing of the Holy Spirit to bring us into a to the fullness of the walk of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Kathy. The, the, we, we are entitled, for our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We are entitled. But that doesn't mean that we have no accountability in order that we might get that inheritance. I'm a son, and my other brother is a son. And he, our dad had an inheritance. And I was the firstborn, and I felt as if I deserved the lion's share. And I was a better guy. I was a better person, and I should get it. I'm entitled to it. But it's the father who has entitled his children to inheritance, but he gives according to his favor. He's, he's appointed unto some this and to some another. And so it is for the favor of the firstborn son that we work for. We are entitled through the gift of eternal life as children of God. But we are pressing for the calling of the high calling of the firstborn son. So that grace, that's the power, the gift of the Holy Spirit within us, available to you, to all Christians who, who recognize and knock and seek and look and ask for the power of the Holy Spirit. My recognition is I, I know it's in the power of the Holy Spirit that I will overcome. I know that it's in the power of the Holy Spirit that I will produce any fruit that will be worthy of Him when I stand before Him. I know that. And I pray, oh, Father, I need Your Spirit. I, I, I ask You for Your Spirit. Get, grant unto me Your Spirit. Empower me in my spirit. Strengthen my spirit that my inner man can take preeminence over my carnal flesh. I realize it's the power of the Holy Spirit in my spirit that gives me that ability to overcome. So it's that indwelling gift of the power of the Holy Spirit being that divine influence on our character. This is that violence. This is that violence. That battle between spirit 
and flesh is the, is the violence that Christ referred to when he said that the kingdom of heaven will be taken by violence and violence uh, by violent men. It is this violence that takes the kingdom of heavens. This, this violence that's internal. That is the purging of the carnal soul or flesh through our conscience as we yield to the truth. As we yield to the truth. Now, what is the truth? Listen up. Truth is the full revealed meaning of the law of Moses and prophets as it relates to God's entire salvation plan. That's what truth is. Now, there's a lot of there's a lot of true facts that are that are uh, found or uh, are presented as truth, but they're really just true facts. So we're looking for the truth, and the truth is, as I said, a, a definition for truth is the full revealed meaning of the law of Moses and the prophets as it relates to God's entire salvation plan. Can you see that? It's not just a portion or a part. And of, of course, the Old Covenant has in it, uh, it has the basis for all the New Covenant. And in its genesis, in its beginnings, in its DNA, are all the truths of God's salvation plan. But they're not readily seen or understood, especially since the greater portion of the, of the Torah, the vast portion of the Torah, is focused toward the Jews. And because it's focused toward the Jews, I'm talking about Old Covenant, it's so, it's so prejudiced, to the Jews, and I don't know if that's the right word to use, but it gets my point across. It's so prejudiced, you know, why shouldn't it be? It was given to the Jews and more by the Jews, but it's so Jew prejudiced that it's difficult to see the fullness of God's salvation plans through their eyes when they look at Moses and they see the promises and so forth. It's a, it is theirs, they are receiving in them, in their own selves, that preeminence that God intended for the, for the covenant to bring these Jews into, but in hidden in its DNA is the fullness of God's salvation plan that extended from Abraham to all the Gentiles. So it is in that you will find truth if you take the new covenant and overlay it, or vice versa, take the old covenant and overlay the, the new covenant, then you can find the truth, the DNA that... Uh, that we can say is truth as opposed to just, well, that's true and that's true, but what is the truth? Somebody had their hand up? Accountability, weightier. Yeah, so much more accountability, but we have a spirit to do it. But why would you take this other new old testament ritual type of God and you need to be doing the weightier and have carrying paper and rubbing it in and having all these So I guess I wanted to address Romans 6. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. I th- I th- I, okay. I, yeah, we talked about it. First of all, the newness of life. The newness of life is what you walk in after your corpse. Your corpse. You've been buried in baptism, in Romans chapter 6. You've been buried in baptism. Mean, it, it, the, the reality there is, uh, uh, is that you're dead and buried in Christ, but it, it's so, the, the ritual is so close to reality that if you just hold you in there just a little bit longer, you're going to be dead. So it's a very close uh, assembly of the actual spiritual reality. And when you come up out of the water, now you're to walk in the newness of life, in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Now we're we related to him in our death. Now to relate him to in his resurrection, which he called the newness of life. The newness of life has nothing to do with the Mosaic Covenant. I have to answer this question first, Kathy. Unless you're going to help me answer this question. You know that I'm going to forget whatever it was, but go ahead. Yeah. No. (laughs) Go ahead. That's right. Yeah. Right. It's, it's good preaching. It's good preaching. It is another sermon. <laughs> it is another sermon. I'm trying to stay on this one, but I'm get off about six right here. When we talk about the uh, the letter of the law, uh, we're speaking in terms of adultery is the same act in both Old Covenant and New Covenant. It is just by what means that we use to address that sin. Okay? So, uh, the letter of the law. What does that mean, the letter of the law? The letter of the law is just as Kathy said, we, we, ad- we address the, the, uh, the sin in the letter of the new covenant law, not in the letter of the old covenant law. Even though the act is the same, there's a completely different dynamic at the watershed. You deal with it one way if you go this way, and you deal with it another way if you go this way. Even though the act is the same, the law, the commandment is the same, but dealing with it is two different ways. And if you deal with it this way, you deal with it in the flesh because no one is justified going this direction. So you have to do, go this way, and you, you deal with it in the spirit. So when you say... Uh, uh, well, the, the law of Moses says don't commit adultery, so don't commit adultery. No, I don't. I know I agree with that, but that is not the reason that I don't commit adultery because if that was the reason, I probably would because I wouldn't have the strength or the inward power or that spirit empowered by the Holy Spirit that would keep me as, it, as the power in the Holy, gift of the Holy Spirit will keep me. So to me, when I read the law, the laws, I read the laws of Jesus Christ. He said, don't commit adultery. But then he went on beyond that, didn't he? So he he encompassed much more. He broadened that commandment way out. So, yeah, in the letter of the law, I'm not following Moses. But in the letter of the law, I'm following Jesus. The laws of Jesus, not the laws of Moses. Hey, this is important stuff. I don't know anybody that's ever tried, that I've ever read, to define this. I'm going down new territory. There's weeds everywhere. There's full-grown trees in my way. I'm whacking and chopping and looking and trying to define something that I know is truth, that was accepted truth back when, you know, nearly 2,000 years ago, but today it's totally lost. I'm trying to resurrect what the real meanings of the Word of God are and that's not an easy challenge. Get up here and try it. Uh, okay, Kathy. Right. Yeah. Right. 
Are you all with me? Do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Okay. I want you to understand that the definition of truth. Truth is the full meaning of the laws of Moses and prophets as it relates to God's entire salvation plan. Christ came and he expounded. He, he developed. He, he expanded uh, that that Moses had, had given. It was given by Moses. So we understand that it's all in there in the Old Covenant, but it needs to be brought out by the New Covenant. The Sermon on the Mount is the Christian's um, Decalogue. The Sermon on the Mount is the Christian's Decalogue. You know, Ten Commandments, as I'm just saying, you know, Mount Sinai and the Law of Moses was, was set up here uh, in the Old Covenant, and that is the, the, the beginnings of the laws that Moses uh, gave. When we look to the lawgiver of the New Covenant, when we look to Jesus Christ, we look to the Sermon on the Mount because it is the Decalogue of the New Covenant. It is the expounding and the filling with fullness of meaning the laws given through Moses. It is not the annihilation of the laws of Moses. He refers, Christ refers to the law and then expounds. You remember he said, you, it is written, or you have heard. He refers to the laws of Moses and then expounds and thereby makes the law uniquely his own. He owns it. Christ owns the law of Moses in a unique way in that he refers to it and he says, it says, but I say. And never in any of the I say did he annul anything in the old. As I said, adultery in the old and adultery in the new. They're the same act. It's how you deal with it. But when he did this, he made these laws uniquely his own. He thus relegated the laws of Moses to an inferior position. It says, but I say. It says, but I say. Here's Elijah, here's Moses, here's my son. Hear ye him. You see, it's the laws of Christ. Uh, that's that Decalogue here in the 5th, 6th, and 7th chapters of Matthew where he owns those laws and then he uniquely makes them his own and then he relegates the law of Moses as inferior to his own. Only he could do that. But only he only could do that is because it was him who gave the Decalogue. I said, but now I say. In other words, I didn't destroy anything that I said back. I didn't make it of no important. I didn't say it was wrong. I said, that said, now I say. It said, I said, now I say. Get it in there. Get it right. Get it in your heart. Let it bury up in there deep because it'll set you free from a whole bunch of that other stuff on the other side of that watershed. <laughs> He's talking about his commandments, not the commandments of Moses. Listen. That, you got to understand there's still power in the laws of Moses. And well, I, I, I speak to that here. I'm not, uh, you know, annihilating the laws of Moses here. I'm trying to show us as Christians who we are to be following. Who is the lawgiver and what laws are we to follow? Those that are preeminently higher and greater that have the ability to draw upon the power and dwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's the ones we're to follow. Not those that don't have that power who, who keep you in the flesh and will have a blood that covers you and every time you do sin, you've got to cover up with that blood again. Yeah, it's outside of the cup. Matthew 23. Whitewashed sepulchers. Not 
not doing away with the significance, that is to say, its worth in instruction. No, with the old covenant. Not doing away with its significance, its worth in instruction, typing and shadowing. What great value it has in typing and shadowing. shadowing. Or prophetic meaning. Not, not, none of the prophetic meaning of the old covenant has been done away with or made insignificant or unimportant. It underscored it if it did anything. And made it even more alive and more real. Because he said, it said, but I say. I, I had this to say back then, but I'll add this to it now. It has historical value. Its vital purposes in leading us to Jesus Christ. Thank God that hasn't been annulled. Thou shalt not is still applicable to the world. And it leads them to Jesus Christ. And, if, and then sometimes it leads us back. But if it's the, we're listening to the right law and the right spirit, it won't be thou shalt not. If any man has sinned, let him repent and, and Jesus Christ will forgive him and cleanse him from all unrighteousness. It's, a, it's under that law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, not the law of the old covenant. So it's vital. The old covenant is vital. And, but to confuse the two is to be in danger. To confuse the two is to be in danger of falling from grace. Grace. Remember, not undeserved, unmerited favor, but the divine influence upon the heart. To confuse the two, Galatians chapter 3 and 4, is to stand in the dangerous ground of falling from the power that has the ability to bring you into the promises of the new covenant, to bring you into the newness of life. You can't walk in the newness of life by walking in the old covenant. You leave the new covenant and go under the old covenant laws when you accept those laws of the Moses. When you put those on you, you leave the grace power and you now put yourself back under that power, that lack of power in the Old Covenant. Oh, you don't think that's right? You need to read your Bible some more. So that's not just one place or two places, but ten places if it's in one. It has to do with circumcision. It has to do with kosher. It has to do with observances. Sabbaths. You who put yourself back under the Sabbath of the Old Covenant, leave the graces of the New Covenant. Sorry. That's the reality. Read it. That's what Paul said. I'll quote it here in a bit. I wrote it down. I think you're talking about Hebrews chapter 10, 33 or so, where it says to trample the blood of Jesus Christ again, or abuse the, the uh, grace. There is no, once you abuse grace, there's, you know, if, you know, or Hebrews chapter 6 is probably where you're referring to. Oh, I, I, here it is. I was right here. I wrote it. But to, to confuse the two is to be in danger of falling from grace. Galatians chapter 3. Examples and warnings are plentiful. And here's the quote out of uh, Epistles. Galatians 4, 9. How turn ye back again to the weak and beggarly rudiments? See, weak and beggarly rudiments is at the watershed going that way with the law of Moses. That's what he compared them to. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you. I'm afraid of you. That's pretty scary. Is it serious? Yeah, it was serious then, it's serious now. Why? Because he is the one that wrote, lest you fall from grace. Well, that's a big deal. How can you fall from undeserved, unmerited favor? Just tell me how. 
Can you fall from undeserved, unmerited favor? <laughs> it was undeserved, unmerited. How could you fall from it? It's either is or isn't. That shows you that the connotation of falling from grace is something different than undeserved, unmerited favor. It's something you grow in. It's something you get empowered in. It's something that strengthens you. You grow uh, more powerful in. It is that divine influence by the Holy Spirit on your heart. Now later, the epistles are given by the Spirit unto the apostles and disciples. This is that. He shall take a mine and shall declare it unto you. Are you all with me? Did I lose you? Somebody's with me, somebody's not. Remember we talked about, I will give you another comforter, and he will take a mine and show it unto you. I'm saying this is that. What is this is that? The epistles. <laughs> the, 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 uh, uh, the book of John, I mean the uh, Revelations. Book of Revelation, Acts, this is that. He shall take mine and shall declare it unto you. Oh, how so? The, the epistles are expanding Christ's words in the Gospels where Christ had already, one, instituted the new covenant rites of baptism and communion. Is that an amen? Had he already done that? I'm, 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 what I'm saying to you right now is the Holy Spirit has come to, sh to bring us and lead us into all the truth. The Holy Spirit has come to take a mind and show it unto you. Now I'm speaking to you in terms of how the Holy Spirit did that and does that. The Holy Spirit did it through the epistles, through the book of Revelation and through Acts. And what He did was he has taken what Jesus said and introduced and just revealed it, expanded it, expounded on it in the rest of those books. Who wrote them? Paul? The Holy Spirit was the answer I was looking for. You couldn't say wrong. Paul, yes, but by the unction of the Holy Spirit. So here it is. This is that. I will take and show, he will take and show you uh, that of mine and show it unto you. He will lead you into all the truth. The Holy Spirit has taken what Christ has already introduced. So we know that it's tied to Christ is what I'm trying to say. And all the epistles are tied to Christ's words. And he introduced baptism and communion. Not the epistles. They only expounded on it. Paul took what he had got from the Lord. Amen? So I'm showing you, it is Christ who instituted those rites that we have. Baptism and and communion. Two, he ordained the ministry. How so? Go preach into all the world, taking this message, gospel. That go preaching, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hey, that's, that's one thing, but I mean, that's the ministry, but he also declared the body understanding. The, the, you know, the, we are a body. He, he, he also introduced that in John 17, 17, 21 through 23. Let's read that. John 17. I got to put a bit in my mouth and draw me back about a, a foot or two. I, I done got, uh, as somebody said, I've done preached myself happy. John 17, 21 through 23. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. So that, that's the concept of the body that, that the other uh, apostles and disciples preached of, uh, ministered to us later, again. Uh, he also introduced and outlined its future mysterious uh, mysteries. Right? In Matthew chapter 13. We, we know that. That the kingdom coming has to do with the mystery that he introduced in Matthew chapter 13. And then another thing that he did was he laid down legislation for his body, for the church. Matthew 18, 14 through 20. Matthew 18, 
I forget you guys don't have my notes. Matthew 18, 14 through 21. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Moreover, if any brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Listen, is that not the uh, that's the administration of the body? I, what am I saying again? I'm just saying that the epistles take what Christ had already introduced and he expounded and expanded upon them. That, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the lawgiver and the laws of Jesus Christ. And the Decalogue of Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. I'm telling you who the lawgiver is and what lawgiver is to the new covenant believer. And that those things that he introduced in the, in the Gospels are also portrayed and expanded and expounded in, in the epistles. Making no mistake, who is that lawgiver? Well, it was Jesus Christ that did this. Not, not Paul, not the Holy Spirit, but Jesus Christ was the author. And Paul was used and the Spirit of God was used. He took a mind and showed it unto you. He didn't take his own deal. And then seven, on the Mount of Olives, he lays out the end times and judgments, doesn't he? I'm talking about Revelation here, the book of Revelation. Doesn't Christ himself in Matthew chapter 23, 24, 25, up to 26, verse 1, doesn't he... Introduce to us the end times? I mean, he carries it way beyond Daniel, Ezekiel, Elijah. He carried it up to a minute, kind of, when will these things happen? And he told us. And he told us not only when it happened, he told us how it would happen and who it would happen to. Again, it's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the lawgiver. He's the, he's the revelator. He's, he's all in all. We're under law. We're under imprecation. We're under a curse that if we don't follow Him, we have a price to pay. It's suffer a loss. Not the curse of internal death, but we have the loss, to suffer the great loss. Look how the Holy Spirit, by the epistles, further explains and applies the laws of Christ from His discourse or Sermon on the Mount. Look, look at this. This is interesting. He prohibits oaths, right? On the, most of you are familiar with it. I don't have to go read it, do I? I'm talking about Matthew chapter 5. You, most of you are from 6 and 7. You're, most of you are familiar with it. In that, he spoke against don't swear by heaven or earth, remember? So he spoke to oaths as it relates to oaths. James 5, 12 expounds on that. Let me just give you a little flavor of what it is that I'm trying to say. To emphasize, James 5. There's one brother who's offended. He's, leave. He's leaving me. Five. <laughs> He'll be the last to leave. Last to leave offended. Well, 512. It says, but above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest you fall into condemnation. My point being that, that that Decalogue or those words that were spoken in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, look, and I'm going to show you example after example how every one of those things that he spoke of are expounded and expanded on by the, by the apostles, the disciples, and the preachers of the new covenant. In that one instance, it was in James. It had to do with oaths. Exactly.
Yeah, my, my emphasis is on, Jeremy, is on Christ, the lawgiver, and Christ, the, who we are to follow. He is our master, he is our teacher, he is our lawgiver, and it's his commandments, and if we love him, we'll keep them. And I'm putting that emphasis on that the, the old covenant was, was at the root uh, of, the roots of the old covenant were at Jesus, were given by Jesus Christ. The new covenant laws are obviously Jesus Christ. Not only those laws that, that he expounded himself in the Gospels, but also those that, that he directed by his spirit who came as another comforter to show of, to them what was of his and he, the Holy Spirit, expounded in them those things that Christ had already introduced. He gave the, the, the true meaning, depths, gave it the depth that it deserved. I, I, that's right. It's, it's something new only in, it's something new from Christ. It's not something new in, in the, from a revelation of their own standpoint, per se, because the mysteries that Paul preached that we understand that Paul got directly from Jesus in Galatians chapter 1, we know that those mysteries of the heavens had begun in Matthew 13. He, he spoke of those mysteries of heaven and explained them through those eight or nine parables that we have listed in Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is let us undo. The kingdom of heaven is us. So he, Paul, simply took that message that Christ had already introduced and expanded on it. Everything that we have is an expansion on the lawgiver. Yeah, it would be ex exactly the same thing. It would be the Spirit carrying on, you know, the Spirit of Christ, if you will, carrying on, uh, expounding on those things of Moses. So we have there, he, has, he, he prohibits the oaths. James shows us again. He commands a non-resistance. This is a pretty uh, apropos uh, commandment, I think, for this day. And I, it is an hour-long message right here. That is how Christ has preached to us and give us the commandments of a non-resistance. And that's in 1 Corinthians 6, 7. There's an example of it in the epistles. 1 Corinthians 6, 7. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Christ gave the commandment uh, as it relates to non-resistance in the 5th and 6th chapters of Matthew. And it's carried, that thought is carried out further and related to the body in 1 Corinthians 6, 7 and as in other places in the epistles. To fellow believers as well as other God-appointed authorities. Watch out. This is going to trample all over your toes. Not only did he, Christ, give commandments as it relates to your brother, but he gave commandments as it relates to authorities. Under Caesar, Right? Render under Caesar. Peter, let me ask you, do the sons owe taxes or, or do the children of the, king, or the kingdom, uh, those that are uh, members of the kingdom? Or, or is it the rulers? Is it the king and his sons that owe taxes? No, no it's, it's, it's the, those that are subjects to the kingdom, not, not the king's children. Okay, that's true. And we, so we don't owe. We don't owe. You and I, Peter, we don't know because this is not our kingdom. But so that there would be no offense, go, take, get, and pay our taxes. So in uh, Romans, the 13th chapter, it says, Owe no man nothing but to love him. And in that same verses, it speaks in terms of following after obeying all authorities. Uh-oh. What? What are you saying, Mike? I'm just giving you the Word of God that Jesus introduced this, this command of non-resistance. You know what that's all about, right? 
that we are to reflect the testimony of Jesus Christ in the earth. And there, there is no offense in love. There is no offense in non-resistance. And so the laws of this age of love and mercy, mercy and grace, has to do with non-resistance. Oh gosh, there's a lot to be said there, isn't there? You know that, that, what that means, don't you? Across the board, non-resistance. I tell you, it's a great place for what I've said before. It's a great place to lean hard on those scriptures that has to do with deliver me from evil, lead me not into temptation. Because if you're in a non-resistant state, which is what we should be in, there's no escape other than another road. Because down that road, if that road leads to anything that has to do with the demand for resistance, you can't resist. You cannot resist according to the Word of God. So the non-resistance was introduced by Jesus Christ. It's a part of the mysteries of the kingdom of heavens. It's a totally different one than Moses, isn't it? Tooth for a tooth, eye for an eye. Okay, here we go. In our commandments, under our Lord, under His laws, non-resistance. We got one there that was the same, os. But this one is a little different. This next one here, non-resistance. And brothers and sisters, does the church need a good dose of the understanding of non-resistance? Wow. What a mess we are. Why do you suppose the Lord said to pray for those that are over authority in you? It's because you have no other recourse than to do whatever it is that they proclaim. Guess what? You, you do yourself a great deal of good if you pray for them. As you can't resist them, not in... Not in Christ's commandments, not in Christ's laws you can't. Find me a place, would you? Bring it to my attention so I'll know it and I can stop preaching this message. Because it's hurt. it hurts me. It hurts me. It hurts my flesh. It causes me to have to yield a lot of things that I don't want to yield to. Non-resistance is not my nature. Non-resistance is not most people's nature. That's the flesh is me and me, me and me and me and me. <laughs> And if it ain't me and me and me and me, it's me and my four no more. So it's, it is a, it's a tough one. But brothers and sisters, it's a part of the commandments of our Lord. It's not a part of the commandments that, as far as I know, are the laws of Moses. So commands love towards enemies. He, he, you remember Christ introduced that. I don't, I'm not too sure that that's in the Old Covenant. Love your enemies. Uh, Romans 12, 20 through 21. I don't remember what, what I wrote. I don't know why I referenced that. Let me read it. I don't remember what it says. Romans chapter 12, 20 and 21. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Brother and sister, why does it say he, he coals of fire? Does that sound kind of counter to love? Well, so does this. So does this. You will rule over them with a rod of iron. Doesn't that, this sound a little different too, doesn't it? That the promises that Christ gave to the overcoming church, part of it was that you would rule over the earth with a rod of iron. Why? Because that's a different age. It's an age of justice, holiness, and the law of Christ. But we are in the law as it relates to Christ in testimony, in mercy and grace. But there will be an age when, when you walked in mercy and grace and gave the other cheek and they slapped you and they asked you to carry this for a mile, you went two. There will be an age where you will, will, you will have heaped on them and you will have the authority to rule with a rod of iron because you lived in the testimony of Jesus Christ, in the faith of His commandments, in the doing of His laws and His words, and you resisted not. And in that manner and way, in that next age, you will rule with a rod of iron because you've been found worthy to rule and reign. 
Fasting is, of course, uh, Christ has mentioned fasting there in Matthew. And then in 2 Corinthians 6, 5, if you'll remember, there's a list there that Paul makes about all those things that he's, he has experienced and withstood and had patience and endurance in, and part of it was often in fastings. And then James 5, uh, I'm sorry, the danger of unforgiveness, James 2.12. I'm going to read a little of that because there's two quotes in James that, that I want to bring out. I didn't intend to read all this. James 2.13, because you don't have my notes, so. For ye shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. So the danger, uh, Christ speaks of the danger of unforgiveness, and James again expounds on on the danger of unforgiveness. And then Christ mentioned the extreme dangers of wealth. You remember? Matthew chapter 6, no man can serve two masters. Mammon. See? And, and is that it? He introduced that. That, that was, a, a, that was a, a revelation to all that heard it, and that was, what the, that was what the Pharisees over that you brought attention to in Luke 16, that's where they, they derided him, the word says, is because they thought that that was, that was uh, contrary to the law of Moses in that he was preaching to them the dangers of having wealth as it relates to covetousness. He said, give it away. Give it away now. Don't, don't, don't even allow that money to have your heart. Give it away. Uh, what a wise man that was, that he gave his money away to, that he might have be welcomed into other men's houses in the age to come. They derided him. That's the introduction of Christ about the extreme dangers of wealth. 1 Timothy 6.17 and James 5.1. Both of those are good as it relates to the same dangers that Christ introduced. 5.1 says, Go to now, you rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh in fire. That's the judgment of covetousness, idolatry of a rich man who has not pondered his way and has taken and hoarded and laid up and store and fell into the many pitfalls that accompany the, the desires to be wealthy. How many Christians fall into that category? I'm going to tell you. More than you think. More of us than you think. Just because you don't have anything doesn't mean you don't, you don't have the... The, the covetousness of it in your heart. Brothers and sisters, that's a tough one, but it's the laws of Christ, and who can feel that? Who can fulfill that in the power of the Spirit, much less in the power of Moses, the weaker method? Okay. And so he also says, his command for Christians to seek the kingdom of heavens. Hebrews 3.1 says we're called to a heavenly calling. 1 Thessalonians 2.12 speaks in terms of in the RV, the, re, the revised version says, As you know, we dealt with each of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Okay. The two righteousnesses or the two sanctifications or the two holinesses. I don't know if those are words or just I made them up, but you know what I'm saying. You know, there's two, there's two righteousnesses. There's two parts to the atonement. There's two degrees of holiness. There's two degrees of righteousness. You should know that. With this, gosh, we have ministered from this pulpit of, uh, 20, 30, 40 times in those areas. But, just in case, we'll take it back to what we need to understand in just a quick summary. For Christ is the end of the law unto righteousness to everyone that believeth. The law of Moses. Romans 10.4. This scripture of Romans chapter 10 speaks again to that Paul laid out, what speaks again to what Paul had laid out in Romans chapter 3 and 4. That is, the example of Abraham for justification in righteousness of Christ through faith. 
That's one righteousness. Justification uh, of, or redemption. Justification in redemption. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. That gift of eternal life. That's one. Let's remember, God called Abraham as our example. Paul used Abraham as our example. And Paul brought out this in Romans, the chapter, third and fourth chapter, and all the way up to the sixth chapter. In the sixth chapter we have that, uh, uh, an allusion to this gift of righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus Christ, redemptive power. And then he speaks again in Ephesians chapter 2 as it relates to this gift. But Abraham, God called Abraham, and he believed, right? This is Genesis 15, 6. God proved Abraham, and he endured. That's Genesis 22, 16, and 18. Are you with me? I'm just telling you, Abraham is our example, and Paul used him in Romans 3 and 4, as our example for a justification, redemptive justification by faith in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He, Paul, used him as an example. And he drew upon these scriptures out of the book of Genesis. And the, the scripture that relates to the gift of righteousness, justification by believing, is found in Abraham's Genesis 15, 6. And then God proved Abraham as he endured. Enduring is something different than believing. Enduring is testing. Genesis 22, 16 through 18. The two justifications were then complete. Let me compare it to New Covenant. Paul. I press daily. I press, I buffet my body, lest I be found to be a, a reprobate. I may be as those that I preach to that, didn't, that hear and don't do. And then in Philippians chapter 3, he, he's speaking in terms of this goal, this high goal that he's pressing forward for. And it has to do with endurance. He had the gift of eternal life, Righteousness, but now he's running the race and looking for the prize. And the endurance that's related to Abraham, Genesis chapter 22, is Paul related, is, has that in view in the third chapter of Philippians where he says that he is pressing and, and trying to attain unto the high prize and giving all the energy and all of his effort for that one thing. That's that endurance of Abraham. So on the one, he's buffeting his body. He's received the justification by faith in the righteousness of Christ. But now he's looking for that second righteousness that has to do with his works. Paul, Paul compares himself there. He is a comparative to Abraham who believed God and God imputed that to him as righteousness. But he endured the test of God and God granted him the prize of the promises, the irrevocable promises. So there's two justifications. Are complete. For his justification by faith, Paul points to the moment of his regeneration. He believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. For his justification by works, James points the way. Isn't that interesting? The Lord used Paul to bring out the justification of faith in the regeneration in the book of Romans, chapter 3 and 4. But then he uses James to bring out the, that further righteousness that goes beyond the justification by faith in regeneration that has to do with works. Or it was James as James points out his final act of accomplished obedience. 
because thou hast obeyed my voice. Okay? I, you know, I should take the time and go there and read the scriptures and let you see the difference between Genesis 15 and Genesis 22. But in Genesis 15, God imputed him righteousness because he believed. And in Genesis chapter 22, it's because he obeyed that he said, I will bless you because of what you did. You obeyed me. And at that point, that was a kid. That's when he was thrusting a knife downward toward his only son when God stayed him and said, because you have done this, he endured. And that is what the James brings out is that now this righteousness of Abraham that had to go further, went on beyond the justification by faith and regeneration, it went on to the works. It went on to the endurance. It went on to a higher level of grace. A higher level of of the divine power working within Him. What works? What are they? The commandments of the Lord. The commandments of the Lord. That's the works of faith. That's what we're talking about here. Go ahead. It, it's, throughout, it's throughout the Scriptures, uh, when, when Christ introduced it, was that a servant, the, the master went away on a far journey, leaving his servants in charge of his stuff. And he came back and he held them accountable. Well, in that they were servants was that meaning that they were regenerated. But in that he came back and judged them was according to what they did with what they, he, they were given. That had to do with their works. It's all throughout the... Uh, the new covenant, where we should understand there's two justifications, two parts to the atonement. You have the minor grace that has to do with regeneration and justification, and the major grace that has to do with the sanctification and the fuller outpouring, the further ewing out in your own heart for the oil to be a wise virgin. That has to do with works. What has been introduced into the church is that faith has been introduced, dead faith has been introduced as works. Believing that Jesus did it all is, equates to all the faith you need. Oh my gosh, what an abuse. What an abuse. You see it? Jeremy?
Yeah, you, you, everything is built on the foundation of regeneration, that first grace, that first smaller, less meritous faith. That faith that said, come out. And he came out. He became the first Hebrew to cross over the waters. Through the water of baptism, he came out. He died to himself. He came. Through that, he said, come out. And through that was less meritous than thrusting a knife down into your son's heart. There was the great merit that earned him the, the promise and the declaration of being a friend of God. That, the irrevocable promises of God that in you I will bless because of what you did, not what you believed, but what you did. That's what the point James makes. Paul's making a different point in those first few chapters of, of Romans because he's preaching to a Jewish people that are relying on their circumcision and their belief in Moses as being the, the, the end all, the, you know, the be all. So I'm bringing out to you again the, the important point that this grace that is within you is to develop this kind of character that can do these works, these great works that will be acceptable unto God and be, you'll be found worthy uh, and it can only be done by the empowering of the Holy Spirit and, the, and the, not only the empowering of the Holy Spirit, but the, the, the leaning on the words of Christ, the, the uh, uh, obtaining and drawing to yourself the forgiveness that is bound up in the atonement of Jesus Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our conscience. That is the law and those laws that have to do with a continuation in the fight or the battle or the prize to be violent. I say to the Lord, forgive me for that flesh yet that's within me that I have yet not crucified. I said, forgive me for that, Father. I know in me yet lies much flesh. But I thank you for what you've given me victory over and I ask you to strengthen me to overcome that that remains within me. See? And I can't get that in the laws of Moses. And there is no... There's no merit in keeping the laws of Moses. You understand? The, Thou shalt not commit adultery is over here. You don't have to worry about it being in the laws of Moses. Don't do it. It's in the laws of Christ. But if I did, I would rather fall under the, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus than the law of sin and death. Woo, we, we'll follow these laws of Moses as long as it tickles our flesh. But the moment, the moment that we're faced with these critical uh, condemnations and, and uh, laws that will bring about death, we'll immediately try to run over onto the other side of the bank. Run into the other tributary. Get under the laws and the spirit of life in Jesus, see? And that don't work because you can't, you can't walk in both camps. Matter of fact, You'll be blind to the one if you're walking in, the, in it. Okay. So well, I think the point's been made how Abraham is an example to us of both justifications, both righteousness. There's two righteousnesses there, right? There's two justifications there, right? There's two sanctifications there, right? Sanctified means set apart. Two set aparts. Set apart when he come across the river. Set apart when he was tested and tried and endured. So there's two parts to this. The atonement of Christ, yes, the gift of eternal life, but the, the, the prize of the sanctified life is something you work out in you. And you've got to know what it is that you've got to adhere to and obey to endure. Who's testing you and trying you? It's God. It's God. He's refining you and making you fit and worthy. And He's not doing it any other way than, please, I love you. Please, follow me. He daily, every day, He's pleading with us, pleading with us to do these things. What's the prize? Well, let's say this. Both these justifications are demand for every human soul. First justification by blood, then justification by obedience. First justification by faith, then justification by works. First justification for the gift of eternal life, then justification for the prize. That participant in the first resurrection of part in his millennial kingdom. 
For blessed is the man unto whom God reckoneth righteousness apart from works. Romans 4, 6. Ephesians 2, 8. But the greater blessing is, is this, the Word of God. The man that endureth temptation, testing, for when he hath been approved, he shall receive the crown of life. <laughs> there it is, the gift and the prize. The life, life more abundantly, glorious. James 1, 12, Philippians 3, 14. I think. Yeah, part two. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, part two. Here's your chance to leave. I, I, it's ten minutes till four. And if you got endurance, we will do this in less than an hour. Part two. I hate not to do it because it's just my typings. And it's, if somebody's going to pull it down on the inner tube, and they're going to find, what is he talking about? Because without explanation, I doubt that it makes any sense. Feel free to get up and leave anytime you want. Here I go. Yes, ma'am. But no, no they, they'll stop there and they'll start, stop at Ephesians chapter 2 uh, where, where it's a gift. Yeah, but that's why this group understands there's two justifications. That's why we connect the dots. Yeah, you can tear, tear out those verses that have to do with the Abraham's faith justification by works. You can tear those out of your Bible if you want and bring no attention to it. If you're going to preach a message on eternal grace, which is, uh, covers everything and anything, if you're going to preach that message, that's the scripture you go to, and you hang your hat there. But it shows that you have no, you haven't connected the dots. You don't have the full truth. Yes, that's true as it relates to eternal life. Yes, but it's not true as it relates to the eternal prize. And that's where Christendom has missed it because they've polarized people and leavened, the devil has leavened the message down where it's licentious behavior, grace, undeserved, unmerited favor. So, yeah. Uh, you, you, I would not argue. I have not argued with those. I agree with them. I said that's right. Eternal life is is uh, it's not based on works. It's not. But it, the prize, what prize? I mean, the prize is eternal life. No, the prize is not eternal life. The prize is eternal glory. The glory has to do with your eternal existence, the quality of your eternal existence. Eternal life is one quality. Glory is another quality. We're looking for the glory uh, infilling in the gift of the first resurrection, which far exceeds what glory there would be in justification of righteousness in, uh, that Abraham received or that David talked about. So that's what you have to speak to him in those terms. You have to know the scriptures. You have to walk them through the prize. You have to show them how the prize relates to to these other scriptures. And that's the way you can connect the dots. When you see there's two justifications, two sanctifications, when you see the two righteousnesses, you, then you can start connecting the dots for them. But what the trouble was with me is I'd hear that kind of message and I'd say, yeah, but what about? What about Hebrews chapter 6, chapter 10? What about all these other verses that have to do with, with loss and, and so forth? Uh, well, there was always some example. It was either the Jews, it's related to the Jews, it doesn't relate to you, blah, 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 whatever the spin is. But the, what, <laughs> what we're ministering by taking the whole Word of God, not just Romans, the first three, four chapters, third and fourth chapter, but we're going over to James. And we're saying, well, here's James says this, Paul says this. Is it contradictory? No, they're talking about two different things, two sanctifications, two prizes, a prize and a gift. They're talking about two different things. So unless, until you become... Familiar enough with that, it's difficult to argue against 
their, their mindset, their religious mindset. That's, that's really, though, where it's at. That's where you can get them. That's where they'll, they'll, the, if they're open-hearted to God, they can hear that. It'll resonate. In a, in a real earnest heart, somebody's heart just, uh, is pointing toward God, they'll hear that. They'll see the difference and want, and want it. I know it. It's difficult. The devil is clever. <laughs> he, that's why he is stealth. That's why he, he, is, uh, he is what he is. He's, his intellect, his abilities are far exceeds a man. Uh, and he has spun some really uh, believable, palatable stories to Christ, uh, to Christians. And uh, he's taken the Word of God, and, and he took the Word of God, and he deceived Eve with it, and he took the Word of God, and he tried to deceive Jesus. Jesus was just too much for him. But uh, he was very successful with all other men, and he still is today. And Jesus is the only one that has been able to match and overcome him and defeat him better than match him. So, part two, the Jews looks for the rise of Israel and the advancement of the nation and the restoration of the Aaronic priesthood with temple ritual. Do they not? Listen, I'm preaching more to, I'm, this is like an addendum. <laughs> There's a specific word that you add to a will. I forget to what the word is, but this is kind of an addendum to what I just ministered. The Jews are looking for the rise of Israel and the advancement of the nation and the restoration of the Aaronic priesthood with temple ritual. That's what's looking. they're looking forward to. It. Unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians that have aligned themselves with their thinking. And that, that's a shame because it is that kind of thinking that has stolen from them the right kind of thinking. Uh, Israel's destiny and preeminence in the earth is sure. That's for sure. It's coming. The restoration of the temple is also sure. No, no confusion about that. But it appears some Christians are confused in that they're enamored with the messianic movement, the Hebraic roots teachings. They have, in many cases, put the emphasis on the wrong lawgiver. And, and they confuse the covenants uh, to their own harm. But significantly, it is not the order of Aaron. This is significant that you guys have heard and understand that is the order of Christ, right? It's the order of Melchizedek. Uh, it's not the order of Aaron. Uh, it, 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 let me put it this way, without me getting into a great depth of teaching about Ezekiel. In Ezekiel, it is said that David is the minister uh, in the Ezekiel's temple. Well, David is not of the tribe of Levi, is he? Jesus was not of the tribe of uh, Levi, was he? So he is the tribe of the Mel Melchizedek. The order that's coming is not under the line, line and order of Aaron. They, they're laying all this groundwork and they're doing all these things and getting their DNA, see what's your line, blood, line, all this stuff. And the reality is that, that that order of the preeminence of Israel has to do with a different order. It has to do with Jesus Christ. In, in the Melchizedek order. Uh, uh, Melchizedek just is, is a type of, of, of the spiritual reality of Jesus Christ. So some confusion over that, uh, but it is the order of Christ. Hebrews 7, 14 and 5 and 10. Hebrews 7, 14 and Hebrews 5, 10. Christ was of the tribe of Judah, not Levi, and shall reign over the earth from his first heaven's throne. On earth, David resurrected will reign as Christ's priest over Ezekiel's temple. Israel is without sacrifice and without epod as it stands today. Isaiah chapter 3 and 4. Christ came not in the order of Aaron as that order was suspended by that of Melchizedek, the lesser being blessed by the greater, right, in Hebrews, the lesser being blessed by the greater, in that, that uh, Melchizedek blessed a Abraham, right? Melchizedek came out with wine and bread, and he blessed Aaron. I mean, I'm sorry, Abraham. The importance is found in understanding that the old order is removed, never to return. The Aaronic order is removed. It'll never return. Those who wait and prepare for that old order's restoration do it in vain. For our high priest is without beginning nor ending. Now, if our high priest was with ending, then there would be some 
hope in that their Aaronic order would be restored. But since he is after the order of Melchizedek, and our high priest beginning in, uh, has been forever, and he never ends, then there is no change in the order. There was a change in the order because of the death of the high priest. But in Christ's case, he does not die, so he ever lives. So our high priest is without beginning nor ending, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, according to the book of Hebrews. As neither birthday nor death day is recorded of Melchizedek, so our Lord was not born in the order of Aaron to the priesthood, for he, never, for he was never born. Jesus was never born, and thus required no genealogy. And his priesthood is not forfeited by death, for he is eternally alive. He never dies. So birth and death to him were but incidents in an e e e eternal existence. Birth and death to Christ were just incidences along the way in eternity. Okay. Behind his birth lies the eternal existence in the Godhead. Before he was born of a woman, he was in the Godhead. Beyond, beyond his resurrection lies the eternity of a glorified priesthood. Are you guys following me? I'm going to hurry through this because I, don't, I know I'm taking advantage of you. So I'm, but I do want to at least pause long enough to, to make sure some of this soaks in because you don't have my notes. So you kind of understand that, right? Christ's order and how it's eternal and how it doesn't have the beginning and doesn't have an end, how that takes after Melchizedek and how that's our future, and the future not only our future but the future of Israel. It has to do with Christ, doesn't it? It's not it's two separate kingdoms, is it? The kingdom on earth, the kingdom in heavens, is both the same kingdom. It's the kingdom of Christ with one high priest, but then one king as well, king of kings and the Lord of the Lord. So the order of Aaron is stopped with the presence of Melchizedek's antitype. And the order of Melchizedek stopped with the eternal high priest, Jesus Christ. As in the type... Christ is without successor and without predecessor. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Thus saith the Spirit of God to the Godhead Son of God, Jesus Christ. Thou art a priest forever. The order of priesthood has to do with Christ. He be, I'm talking about the millennial period of time. I'm talking about the re preeminence of Israel back on the earth. I'm talking to you about the, the error of our friends that are lost in this Hebraic root, Messianic, blah, blah, blah. I'm trying to bring a little, shed a little more light, throw a little more light. Why, why it is that we need to wake and rightly divide the Word of God as it relates to these things. He began. He, because he abideth forever, hath a priesthood that doth not pass to another. Hebrews 7, 24. There is a correlation between today's wannabes that presume to stand in his stead or encroach upon his authority only, as did Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. 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 Of old. Right? You remember him? Moses, you take too much upon yourself. We also are the seed. And we also are priests. Isn't that the words of them? Well, I'm saying that in this end time, there are those that encroach upon this, this priesthood thinking. We speak of those who through false doctrines presume a power in priesthood that only they may administer the blood and the body of Christ in a true remembrance and reunion of Him. Transfiguration. Transmutation. Whatever the word that the Catholics use for a description of when they pray over the bread and the wine, that it literally becomes the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make a point that this is a this is treading all over the authority of Jesus Christ, and that it in a man, in a way in a, in a form it relates back.
to Korah in his presumption that he was as good a priest as Aaron. He was just as called, just as anointing, and he could take the place of Aaron without any problem. I can do it. And here we have an example today of several more examples of Korah-type thinking. And one of them has to do with the Catholic Church. Not only the Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church. Jim, I think you backed me up on this. There are other churches that have the same kinds of thinking. It's not just Catholics. So it is a, it is a terrible, uh, gross, sickening uh, abuse of, of the communion. So there, there, there's a whole group uh, of the millions of people that, are, that have been duped into thinking that these are the priesthood. When Christ himself is the priest, and, and we all in part are priests under him, that they have found themselves the only appointed ones that can not only serve communion, but in the only ones that can do this magical thing and, cre and create something out of nothing and make, and when only they pray is when it happens. This is, a, this is a treading all over the authority of Jesus Christ and presuming on themselves a, a worse thing than Korah. And God, I'm going to just say it. Come out from among them. Because when the earth opens up and they have to stand before God, th there's going to be a, a horrifying awakening to the lies that have been perpetrated down those lines. Believing such heinous lies, uh, it just sickens me. Uh, it is. It is the spirit of Antichrist. <laughs> yeah. 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 You, it, they weren't. He wasn't talking about the heathen. He was talking about those that thought of themselves as having a close relationship with him. And these that I'm speaking of, too, have that same kind of religious attitudes. It's condescending, it's prideful, it's antichrist. And it's the same spirit that will carry on into the death of multitudes of martyrs in the last days. Because they, the Roman Catholic Church, align themselves with the antichrist. And it's because of the, that church will, that, that will shed again the blood that they shed over the centuries with a lull over the last couple hundred. But still, the spirit of it is alive. The spirit that, allow, that has that kind of attitude that they think that they are the only ones that have, can stand in authority with Jesus Christ to give you communion. And, and it has to be me a priest, not just a layman. I just ha I have to be up in the order in order that I can be appointed to, to give to you, you lay people, you worthless nothings, uh, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't take it from me, you don't get the real thing, and you don't get the real priest. I am him, and the thing I give is real. Brothers and sisters, that is as demonic a teaching as there is in the world. And it's called Christianum. It's Christ-like, according to most of the rest of the world thinks that's, that's the way it is. That's the way we believe. Yeah. 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 And the Greek is to, dis or I, I, I've read before, back me up on this if it's true, grade my paper here, but I believe the Greek was used so that, that no common person who wouldn't know Greek 
wouldn't be able to speak Greek, couldn't officiate in that service. That's why it was in Greek. It still is. Okay, what am I doing? I'm just saying that underneath the auspices of Christendom lies this undercurrent of leaven and lies that it has to, they're so strong that it's taken millions of people down a wrong path. And it's not just Catholics, there's other groups. And if this is just one instance of Korah. I've got another one. But this one is really easy to discern and real easy if your heart is open and your mind is open to the, the severity of that crime, you can see if God called, opened up the earth for Korah, how much more he's going to open up the earth for these. That's the reality. That's why he said come out from among them. And then, and then did I miss somebody? The, the whole thing, the whole practice flies in the face of Scripture. It is it's totally unscriptural. But they use a few Scriptures to warrant it, even though it's in the, it doesn't take much to ferret out if a person can read their Bible with an open heart, that it's just ridiculous. It is. Part of it is what you just said. Yeah, Latin. That's what I was trying to. That's what I was trying to say. I said Greek, but it was Latin. You're right, Latin. Okay. <laughs> A grave error for them that consti uh, uh, constitute these followers, who presume presume a power not theirs, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and they went down into the pit. And they perished from among the congregation, number 16, 31 through 33. There's also another group of Christians who have aligned themselves with a priesthood that take a condescending position in a so-called superior sacrifice. There's a superior sacrifice to the one that we have been given, a superior offering. That of observing as a Christian the laws of Moses. This is a presumption of, of a group, of, a large group of people uh, that, that presume uh, there's a greater offering than the one we have, that of Christ. Oh, really? Yeah. In that observing as a Christian the laws of Moses. That that appointed by God in Christ, actually in many cases, uh, is, a sincere, is a sincere t uh, attempt to guard the holiness of God and accountability for a believer uh, to offset that li licentious behavior that was afforded in the cheap grace message. In other words, a lot of those that would put put us under the laws of Moses are, are saying there's got to be accountability and they've tried to, they mistakenly have tried to enforce the Mosaic law on Christians. Uh, this is not a new development, uh, as this was the case of many Jewish converts of the apostolic days, of the apostles' days. You know, they, they also, those Messianics that came in, uh, in, in our book of Acts, in chapter 15, we can see a lot of zealots and the church gathered together, those, those believers, and they, they were trying to safeguard uh, uh, the, the, the law. In other words, they were trying to make sure that there wasn't this licentious behavior. And they said, well, they've got to do this, and they've got to do that. and they, you know, they can't, We can't just be lawless. And, and the arguments were then set forth back and forth as to why we weren't under the laws of Moses and why we would not put that burden upon uh, the, the Gentile converts, if we couldn't carry the load uh, of the Moses law, we sure don't want to put these new Gentile people under the load of the law. But it was not so much as they were trying to get back to the Mosaic law as if they were arguing against any kind of licentious behavior. They knew that wasn't of God. So there was, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a dismerited or what discredited them or to call them evil. They were just they were just trying to figure out at that point 
what, what, what the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus really consisted of. And there was this revelation that Paul was bringing, when Peter was bringing, and James was bringing, and they all fitted it together, and they come up with some uh, scriptural uh, things to, to offset their zealousness to guard against licentious behavior. And a lot of that today, I think, flows and follows out of Christendom, where people have been touched by the holiness of the Spirit of God and have seen the worth and the value of walking a holy life, but they haven't understood the second part of the righteousness and atonement of Jesus Christ, and so they've tried to incorporate the laws of Moses to guard against lies, licentious behavior. Does that make any sense? And I think that is a lot of it. So when I say these things, I'm saying I say them in love to a particular group who were like me, who I, that's the way I felt. Oh, no, the law hadn't passed away. It's true, and it's right, and it's good, and we got to follow it. I mean, that, that was my natural propensity because I have a mind that God wants holiness out of us. So I couldn't, couldn't align myself with this message that was filled in Christendom, has felt filled Christendom. So I'm speaking as one that was like them, zealot, who would stand up and say, no, they have to keep the laws of Moses to be, to be uh, Christians. Well, the reality is uh, we, we got it confused. We're confused. Just as they were confused, Many are confused today. When, we, we, when pressed, this sin, not too dissimilar than that of Korah, although Korah was a presumption in who was qualified to be a priest, and although qualified as priest, these, these us and others, Messianics, Hebraic roots people, they, they are, although they're qualified in Christ as priests, their grave sin is what is qualified to be an offering or a sacrifice. It is in the one case joining an unauthorized priest to an authorized sacrifice and in the other an authorized priest to an unauthorized sacrifice or offering. That is to say a joining of the Mosaic law with the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. Do you see what I'm saying? It's a little difficult maybe to follow, especially if you don't have the notes. But the, the two camps, we have Catholicism and we have this presumption that's on the, the, as far as the priesthood and, and then how it's to be administered. And then on the other hand, we have uh, an offering, which is Christ and Christ only as it relates to atonement and as it relates to his laws and as it relates to his order. And there is an, a a movement to instill and install and incorporate along with that the offering of keeping the Torah. Uh, the commandments of Moses. Uh, sun sets, sun rises, keep us, seats, kosher, Sabbath, on and on. That's mixing the sacrifices. That's missing the offering. Where one is mixing the priesthood, this is missing, uh, mixing the offerings. Oh, you think not. Or you kind of think maybe that's right. Listen, it's grave. It's serious. It's, it's serious for us who have fallen into that trap of trying to offer unto Christ unto God an offering in Christ that's in Moses. <laughs> and that is the, that's the sad state of falling from grace and, and not correctly appraising the atonement of Jesus Christ. That's serious stuff. You, you think not that it warrants it? You think ignorance uh, excuses it? Uh -uh. Ignorance doesn't excuse it. You will... It, uh, it's one of those things that for every moment that we waste thinking that and doing that, we, we lose opportunity. And that at the end of that trail is a suffering, a great loss. Because that holiness that we spoke about that follows the tributary of keeping the laws of Christ and the, having the empowering of the Holy Spirit is, is being uh, convoluted with a contrary message. You can't mix it. You can't mix it anymore. You can mix it with uh, paganism. I'm 
Sorry, there's the, that's the reality. They, on the one hand, recognize the atonement. I'm talking about these different groups. They, on the one hand, recognize the atonement efficacy of the blood of Christ as it relates to regeneration, but have little understanding of the greater divine influence of the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit in the atonement and how to walk in its sanctifying power and its greater accountability in the word says, being not without law to God, but under the law of Christ. 1 Corinthians 9.21. You should, that should be a scripture that you can always turn to and know. It's so clear. 1 Corinthians 9.21. Here's Paul, and this is his argument. And unto the Jews if I came as a Jew, that I might gain, to, gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law. Being not without law, really, to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. In other words, to those inside the Jewish community, he went in there with a stealth message that he, he looked to be as they were and are, but whoop, what a surprise. He's not exactly like we thought. And he snuck up on them, many of them, and got them converted to Christianity. And then that's those that were in the law. God, he would go in there, he'd do the things that you need to do to pass, to pass the sniff test, to get in. But then once in, he, he preached the message of grace, of, of, the, of the Messiah. And those that are without law, he, he became as without law without Jewish law. He ate, he did the things that they did that the Jews wouldn't do. He became that way. Not, and he says, not that, that I became to those that, that have no law as having no law, for I do have law. I have the law of Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying here. But I'm, I'm, I'll go either side. I'll go either camp. I'll go either I'll go over here and I'll eat a pig, or I'll go over here and I'll abstain from a pig. That's what he was saying. He says, I have freedom. I have the freedom of the truth. I'm not, I'm not polarized to your religious ideas of who God is anymore. He has set me free. He's taken the scales off my eyes, and I've been baptized in water and raised up and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And this is my freeing message to you. Be not again in tote, in yoked with those things of bondage, but be set free in the liberty of Jesus Christ. That's the message he preached to the Gentiles who had turned again, trying to do the Mosaic law. They weren't even Jews. They were just Gentiles. But Jews came in stealthily and said, you got to be this, you got to do that, you got to be circumcised, you can't do that. See? And he came in there a swinging and a slaying and a kicking and a fighting and said, well, who has deceived you? Who's bewitched you? Uh, I wish they'd go ahead and emancipate their whole self. Not just circumcised. I mean, he was mad. These are, these are messages from, from the devil. Brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here. <laughs> if, if in, some, in some quarters, I'd be getting booze and, and, and tomatoes. I don't have any scriptural backing that says that he ate pig, but uh, I do see that I see in his writings where he 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 wasn't a stumbling block to anybody, and that he I see in his writings that he had freedom to partake of anything that he wanted, and uh, I, I see in his writings that he uh, he he rebuked Peter for. Uh, for separating himself, himself when the Jews visited him and separated himself, Peter separated himself unto them and did the rituals and the rites that the, the Jews did so that he wouldn't bring any offense to them. And, but then he offended the Gentiles. So I see all what Paul, I see the spirit of what Paul's saying. I see the spirit of what the Lord is saying uh, by his spirit in that, that by prayer everything is sanctified. By prayer. And that... Uh, 
that, that you know, uh, the kosher is not a law for us to be following. It is a mosaic law. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not purporting that Paul ate pig, but I'm saying that he, didn't, he wouldn't have an offense if people ate pig. There's no offense. There was no offense there. One husband, one teacher, one, uh, one lawgiver, <laughs> not, not to another. So he, he, Paul was not without law to God, but he was under the law to Christ. Uh, rely on keeping the Mosaic law as a definition of sin. He didn't rely on the, uh, keeping the Mosaic law as a definition of sin. And as it answers to continued communion in his favor. As it answers to his communion in his favor. What, what am I saying? I'm, not, I'm saying that there's no favor in following the laws of Moses. Matter of fact, if you're a Christian in the wrong attitude, you're an offense. But if you have the right attitude and you are observing something for its value, its historical value, its structural value, whatever, the, the, the correct heart in that this is not, uh, not, not something that's required of me, nor does it gain me any favor with God. See, Paul knew that none of these things had anything to do with favor with God. He knew that these were all types and shadows. Kosher was a type and a shadow. He knew that. That's why, you know, I can't say he ate pig, but I know that's why he had no offense with it. Because he knew that, that, that kosher was a type and a shadow. As, as was many things, as all these things are. So, you know, I hear in some, some circles that, that it's purported that it's, it's, it's not a sin uh, to keep kosher. I mean, it's not a sin not to keep kosher, but God prefers that you keep kosher because it's a commandment. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's not a sin to... I haven't heard this much. It's not a sin to not keep this, the Sabbath. I haven't heard that, really, but this one must pretend that I have. It's not a sin to keep the Sabbath, not keep the Sabbath, but God prefers that you do. See? He, he, he desires that you keep the Sabbath. Uh, implying that if you don't keep the Sabbath, you're out of favor with them, which is a lie. It's a hook. It's, it shows that the heart is, is mixed at the best with who is the lawgiver. It's mixed. It, it's not sure, sure. I'm not sure where, where I'm supposed to align my... Where are my allegiances? Are they here under the Moses? Are they here under Christ? Or if, I don't know. I don't know. And then the reality, I'm just laying it cold, hard facts to you according to the Word of God. We are free from it. Not only that, if we observe it in the wrong spirit, we're an offense to the Lord. Well, if you take that another step, Jeremy, dead people uh, can't, you know, there's no writ that can be served on a dead person. Don't do no good. But the reality is you're not dead no more because you're alive unto him. And so you're to walk in the newness of life. And in the newness of life, there's no mosaic law. Right. Well, yeah, it, it was had to do with the, this disciples were it were eating on the Sabbath. Uh, yeah, there, 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 you know, but there's an answer to all those types of scriptures, a counter answer from over here on the Messianic, uh, the law keepers and the Judaizers and the Hebraic roots people. There's an answer to every one of those verses. I, I, there's counter. That's right. And I'm going to give you connecting the dots so you can get the spirit and truth. 
And that's why I say I'm not, I'm not so much arguing against them or bringing up the Scriptures to, to refute them as I am in this deep, passionate search for the heart of God. And His heart leads me here. And He says, Mike, no, not there. Don't do that. That's the offense to me. Here's where I am. Read my Word. So it's a byproduct. I'm just teaching stuff that's a byproduct of my own heart to serve Him in the most pure way in Christ that I can. And I've discovered it ain't over there. Stop that, He said. The Word says. It's not popular. <laughs> not, not from the circles I come to. I come from a lot bigger circle than this little circle. <laughs> and, and this little circle is a a reflection of my stopping the other big circle. <laughs> but, but that's fine. You know, uh, you got it. the whole thing is, 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 is not about being right. It's about being Christ-like. And, uh, it's no, uh, Jim. It's neither circumcision or uncircumcision, neither kosher, or unkosher, neither keeping Sabbath or not keeping Sabbath. You just go down the list, but it is love energized by faith. See, that's, that's whatever I said, faith energized by love. So that's, that's the reality, that's the truth, and where is that? That's not some vague something or another, some, some beautiful poetic kind of uh, nebulous, uh, ethereal thing that we can't get a hold of. It's the it's the strength of the gospel, the energy it, that the Holy Spirit applies to our faith in Him in Christ Jesus allows us to keep those things, those laws that please Him, and stay in the race to become like Him, and to be found in the end worthy and fruitful. That that's that's the reality. That's true law keeping. That's true law keeping and knowing that you're, in, you're fallible. You're, you're subject to daily sins and yet you're not disconnected if we are properly applying the atonement of, of Jesus Christ as it relates to our being sanctified. Not redeemed, we already redeemed, but sanctified. Okay. Wait a minute, stop the presses. Jerry is speaking. What is this? <laughs> I don't know what this means, but I'm to mark the moment. Okay, Jerry. Go. <laughs> no, no, I know it's significant. What, what, what was you going to say? Jerry, I, I, it, Patty will uh, attest to this. Her, and now you've heard me tell the stories too. I've heard you say that. But here's, an, here's this, my old story again. And forgive us old men, we tell stories over and over. <laughs> but Patty can attest to this for those who hadn't heard, that one day I was reading the scriptures, about 1970, 71, 2, 3, 4, somewhere in there, 5. I was reading the scriptures and I saw that Jesus cast those demons into those pigs. And I said to myself, if Jesus thought no more of those pigs than that, I'm not eating it no more. <laughs> and my favorite food was what? A pork roast. I would have her fix one of those every week. And that was no small thing for me to see that. But in my heart, it had nothing to do with kosher. It had to do with, with just a revelation of some type that it, was, it shows the heart just wants to align with, with the Lord. And you don't need to have this articulated out you know, thing, a list of do's and don'ts there. Okay. I'm going to finish. Praise the Lord. So, 
So the loss, I'll skip a little bit here. The loss of true, I want, I want, I want to make sure I made that point, though, that in, in both those groups, we have the, a different offering, a different priesthood. We have a, a sin that's similar to that of Korah, Dathan, and Biram. It was uh, a presumption to, to, to take upon themselves to administer uh, a different gospel, a different truth. It, it's not a different truth. It's just uh, a different... Um, it's a different uh, reflection of the truth. It's a, what's the word? I'm a version, different version. Yeah, different version, but that's not even still as strong as the word that I'm looking for. But it's not the truth, and for it, uh, there's a grave penalty. Yeah, and I'm I'm not I'm I'm in, I'm only saying in terms of the of the leaven. I'm not specifically speaking to any person. The loss of true understanding through the leaven of false teaching. Truly, we are sorrowful in the warning, as was, was Moses, uh, where Moses said, "Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sin." That's, that's the thing that I, my point is. I believe these things are worthy of those same kinds of judgments that came on Korah. The sin is a contrary message to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Any reliance upon the law of Moses is a left-handed denial of the power of the Holy Spirit, exclusive in the atonement of Jesus Christ. Our offerings are of spiritual nature when we understand spiritual things. Then these offerings of a spiritual kind affect our nature. The first few chapters of the first book of Peter read in this mindset, or read this them in this mindset. They may shed some light on the required holy dynamic. First Peter one says, "Elect." That's how it starts out. Elect, which is is heavenly call. That's the heavenly call. The elect. That's that's us, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through. Sanctification. That word sanctification in the Greek is holying. I was surprised to find that. Holying. H O L Y I N G. Holying. That, that, that's really good. In other words, I could read it like this I could read, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through holying, holying. Of spirit. Holy ing, holy ing of spirit. And the S there should be a little S. There's no holy ing of the Holy Spirit. But the holy ing is by the Holy Spirit in our spirit. Holy ing of spirit unto, into is the Greek word, into obedience and sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you. That's the, that's the spiritual dynamic because Peter goes on to say our offerings are spiritual offerings. Spiritual offerings, see? We, we don't have some, some, uh, some tangible, physical kind of offering like a keeping this or doing that. Our offerings are spiritual offerings and they have to do with holying our spirit, our soul bringing it into likeness of Christ. That's the dynamic. That's the spiritual dynamic. This is an entirely different means, you know? This sprinkling of the blood of Jesus, this sanctifying that Peter brings out according to the foreknowledge of God, this is that salvation plan that's discovered in the new covenant that was hidden in the old covenant, that this is, a, this is the product of listening to Christ and his expounding on the law, we discover that God, through his foreknowledge, had as a father a holoing, holoing, holying in mind of our spirit as sanctification. And it is through obedience. And that is by the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you. In other words, it power unto you. 
divine influence unto you, Peter is saying. This is an entirely different means of holding, sanctifying than the covenant of Moses. That covenant of Moses, righteousness has to do with conformity. <laughs> I didn't meditate hard on this or long. I just had to come up with a bang, hit me in the head. I don't know. I should probably should think about it more, but here's what I wrote. That covenant of Moses, righteousness, has to do with conformity with the commandments of God. Holiness has to do with growing closeness in his character. Righteousness has to do with right standing with God. Holiness has to do with close proximity to God. Righteousness, this justifying righteousness, this gift that Paul spoke about in Romans 3 and 4, is a is a right standing in right right standing with God. But it's not that kind of justification or righteousness that is this holding, holding that brings you into close proximity with God in through the veil of Jesus Christ into the Holy of Holies. See, that that's the dynamic that's misunderstood and laws of a different kind are trying to be applied to this spiritual dynamic that, ha that has to be in that tributary of listening to Jesus Christ as the lawgiver. Close proximity is what we pray for. It's what we're working for. <laughs> hey, God's the one that set these prizes before us. God's the one that's called us to it. God's the one that is, has, has had this come up in his mind. It's his foreknowledge. It's his desire. I want all God has for us. Yeah. Yeah. What scripture is that? Good, good, company, good company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character, but I was trying to think where that scripture is. I, okay, you look while I continue. Righteousness has to do with keeping the law plus something else. Righteousness has to do with keeping the law plus something else because no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. Because the law does not justify for any reason save obedience. Neither sorrow or repentance is recognized by the law. Hey, have you ever been before a court and they judged you in the law and just because you were sorry that you did the crime, they forgave you and sent you on your way? That's the way the law is. The law of Moses is just that way. It's good, it's right, it's holy, it's just, but it doesn't have a place for your whining and crying and woe and, and I'm sorry and I wish I wouldn't have done that. Please forgive me. Okay. No. And why? Because it un it, that would undermine the whole purpose of justice, it, it, wouldn't it? I mean, the law has got to be law. And isn't that one of the problems of man trying to, to, uh, to apply the law in the, in the way that we apply it? But m my point is, is that this is... Uh, that righteousness has to keep in the law plus something else. And because no man is justified by the law, and no one is declared righteousness, declared righteous by the law. For the just shall live by faith. Boy, we haven't understood that. It was in the old covenant, it is in the new covenant. The just shall live by faith. That's that same dynamic that you were referring to in James. Justification has to do with faith. Okay, not the law. The, the means cannot be conjoined as one method into obedient holiness depended upon inferior earthly means for accomplishment, and the other method of holiness depends upon a spiritual means for accomplishment. Uh, verse, oh, I'm going on, I'm talking about Peter, the, the additional scriptures. Verse 3 and 9 says, Abundant mercy hath uh, begotten us again unto the lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This resurrection of Christ is the basis of our faith to walk in the newest life in an inheritance incorruptible, 
free from the struggle against our own corruptible flesh. That's that, again, that's that violence. Let me say it again. This resurrection power, the newness, walking in the newness of the Spirit, walking in faith, that, that we might inherit an incorruptible, uh, incorruptible uh, body and soul in the resurrection, free from our struggle. Uh, that, that dynamic is worked out it, it, by violence. We're violently resisting the, the powers of our own carnal flesh. It's the cause of our heaviness and much sufferings through many temptations and trials. It is our active resistance against unholiness in faith, in His resurrection, power, that is being tested and refined in the fire that it might be found at His return worthy of His praise and glory in the salvation of our souls. It is the spiritual dynamic outside the law that was in view. Verse 10, 16, 1 Peter. And I'm sorry, I meant to read these scriptures and walk you through uh, 1 Peter, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to finish uh, and let you read the first. 1 Peter 1, chapter 1 into 1 uh, Peter 2. Verse 10 and through 16, it says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace. What? Come on now, remember? Remember the Lord has spoke to us now by His, His Son? But the prophets saw there was a further salvation. It was the salvation of the soul. These prophets saw that, and they inquired and searched diligently, and they prophesied of, the, of this grace. Uh, a, a different, more powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit unto holiness than that could be accompanying in the, new, in the old covenant and must accompany the new covenant. Because they saw there was this something that he's speaking of, and it's a, it's a salvation by grace, but it's, it's a further outpouring of the Holy Spirit to a deeper salvation. Those prophets saw it that, uh, that should come unto you. Here's the full verse uninterrupted. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he hath but as he which hath called you is holy, so be you holy in all manner of living, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Again, that has to do with the quality of existence in eternity. Holiness worked out here through the dynamic of the atonement of Jesus Christ unto worthiness of the first resurrection leads to a close proximity to God and leads to a holiness that won't be duplicated in the purgings of Hades in the thousand year period before the second resurrection. The, the, the holiness that we through faith wrestling and violently take a hold of by the indwelling and power of the Holy Spirit yielding ourselves unto it and the crucifying of the flesh is the highest form of holiness known unto a man. <laughs> As a, that's going to bring you in close proximity with him. All due to Jesus Christ. No credit to man, but all due to Jesus Christ. And that holiness that we yield unto and allow to work out in us has that great recompense of reward of an indwelling, uh, glorifying in resurrection that will, will be like unto the sons and rule and reign with him. There is a purging and that all will be found holy as we determined a week or two ago, that there's no unholiness that will enter into the eternities after the second resurrection. That's what that's all about. 
It's excluding all that's unholy. Only that that's holy will be able to survive and go into eternity. The rest will be incarcerated. That holiness will, there is a holiness that can be worked out in the Hades, in that second, before the second death, that can be applied to us who have ignored the workings of the Holy Spirit and the atonement of Jesus Christ while we're alive on the earth. But it will not compare in proximity to those that had allowed that work to be done in them in their lives. For they will be the inheritors of all the promises of the first three chapters of Revelation. New name, name written on the pillar, etc., etc. All of those things don't follow the holiness that is worked out in those, the purgings that are worked out in those that... Re- that will remain till the second resurrection, that won't be the same promises won't be kept in them. They won't receive those things, though they'll be resurrected holy. Are you with me? Names found in the book of life. This is a once in a time life, once in a lifetime offer. That's not like a barker. Hey, this is what are you gonna give for? This is a once in a time lifetime offer. Hey, what are you gonna give for? If I give you 10, give me 50. See, this is our opportunity. We can't, we can't mess this up. And if you're messing it up, man, the thing to do is get on that knees. Can you not pray one hour? Come on. We can pray one hour. I mean, it's amazing what one hour of prayer would do for all of us today. Woo! Look what just 15 seconds does for us. Or a minute. Or five. Look what a whole hour would do. It'd probably help us a lot to avoid a whole lot of temptation, right? The commandment is the same, last sentence, the commandment is the same in both New Covenant and Old Covenant. Be ye holy. It is only the means that has changed. There is no freedom from law and sacrifice. There is no freedom from law and sacrifice. It is the law of Christ that we must align ourselves with that we might obtain the power into obedient holiness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's right. But it was the hour. It was 10 tail when I said it'll take an hour. And it did. But I didn't give it my very best effort. But uh, I think enough to make a few points uh, that uh, also hopefully um, the Holy Spirit will use to minister to you the it's another, it's another piece, right? It's another part. It's another increment of moving in the direction of, of where the Lord wants us to go. Father, I ask you in Jesus' name. You know, there's just, you, can't, you can't say it too much. I don't, there's nothing rote and there's nothing dead uh, in, in, in Jesus' name. You know, they say, you think that you'll be heard for your much praying. Well, it does. Let me just ease your fears. You you can't say in Jesus' name too many times because it's the only leg you got to stand on. But we got that in His name. We can approach the Father, and in His name, I approach Him, and I I know that uh, You're working in us, Lord. What a wonderful opportunity! What a wonderful work that You've set out to do in us, uh, help us, strengthen us with your spirit in our spirit. And I pray that you will strengthen all of us in our inner man, Lord. Uh, it, takes, it takes your spirit uh, strengthening our spirit. Our spirit's got it. Our spirit gets it. Uh, but it's just a little brother. It's just Abel, just trying to keep from getting killed by Cain. It's just it's younger and smaller, and but boy, it's got it, and it gets it, and uh, we we need we need more strength in our spirit, Lord. We, we need to listen to our spirit. Uh, we need to listen to our conscience that's being uh, tutored and led by your spirit in the minding the things of Christ. We need that. We need to have a, a renewed mind to to the laws of Jesus Christ. What is he? What is he requiring of us? And what is his purposes and his goal? And, and when we look, we see. We look and see that he would like us to be like him. 
and walk in this earth in this manner. And it's all those things that he said that he intends for us to incorporate into our walk in being like him. How can we be his witnesses? How can we be a testimony of him if we walk in our flesh and not in the spirit? I ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, we need, we, we need is not even a, a near strong a word to describe what, what we need in our hearts. It, uh, we need empowered by the Holy Spirit. We we sin, we we break communion minute by minute, Lord. We're just a mess. But praise the Lord, we can come to you for mercy and grace. Mercy first, because we don't get any grace on any merit. We need to get any divine power on merit. And we're going to get it on mer because we cried out for mercy. And we, we've prayed the prayer of asking, and sought, and knocked. And here we are. We need it. We need your mercy in the name of Jesus. Every one of us here in this room, Lord, need your mercy. We need your forgiveness for, for numerous uh, sins, for numerous things that we continue to do, not just unknown sins, but known sins. We haven't, we haven't got this thing down, Lord. We haven't, we haven't crucified this flesh near to the degree that we want to or desire to. And what we need to do is to see that there's hope, and we need to see that we can and that, that you intend for us to, and that there just isn't anything as strong as you and your spirit. And if you will strengthen us, and you will help us, and that we will listen to the spirit, and that we will renew our minds to your word, we can do this. We can walk in this uh, way that you will accept us and, and impute unto us the second righteousness, the second sanctification, that, that worthiness and that fruitfulness that only comes through obeying Christ's commandments. That's what we desire. Not from rote ritual or do's and don'ts, but a nature. A nature that just knows. And no, I'm not going there. No, I'm not laying my eyes on that. I'm not. You know, a, a definition that the Lord has stuck, struck me with, been very helpful for me, in that the lust of the eye, the lust of the eye, is the evil, see if I can remember, it's the evil uh, meditation, uh, uh, the evil meditation on unholy things. Or, no, here's a better way I heard it. It's the evil, it's evil curiosity to meditate on unholy things. It's the evil curiosity to meditate on unholy things. Brothers and sisters, that's the lust of the eye. The lust of the flesh and the pride of life. But these things are, are things that we need to have the Spirit of God help us incorporate uh, into our lives. We need to reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive unto Christ. Walk in newness of life in this Holy Spirit, prompted by His Spirit in our conscience, following after him and his commandments and words with a, with a mindset unto holiness, like he is holy. God, help us. The, the, the flesh is, is weak, but the Spirit is willing. Help us, Holy Spirit. Strengthen us in the name of Jesus. Forgive us in the name of Jesus. Wash us in the name of Jesus. Restore us in the name of Jesus. Reconcile us one to another. Father, teach us to love one another. Teach us to lay down our lives for one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.